Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lisa Thornton, the assignment judge in Monmouth County, um, and I am delighted to introduce the fantastic program that we have for you today. Um, Rebecca tells me that I need to give you two instructions. Number one, there'll be questions and answers at the end of the program. We're going to reserve a little time. And for the best view, she tells me you should pin the speaker view. So today's program is really, I think, a combination um, and a celebration for Women's History Month, as well as Law Day, where the theme um, and the star of the show for Law Day this year is Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We have um, three fantastic women um, that are going to participate in the program today. Um, I've joked that I don't know how they have allowed me to get on the same screen with them. Um, Justice Virginia Long um, was a member and a distinguished jurist um, in the New Jersey judiciary for over 30 years. Um, she was first appointed as a trial judge in 1978, um, was promoted to the appellate division, um, and in 1999, she was elevated to our state's highest court. Um, she came to the judiciary um, after serving several prominent roles um, in state government, including uh, consumer affairs in the Department of Banking and Insurance. Um, judge, our very own Judge Mary Catherine Cuff um, was a member of our judiciary for nearly 30 years. Um, she was appointed to the trial court in 1988. In 1984, she was elevated to the appellate division. Um, and between 2012 and 2016, uh, she was temporarily assigned to our state's highest court until her retirement in 2016. Um, prior to her service um, in the judiciary, uh, she was a deputy attorney general with the State Department of Law and Public Safety and an AUSA with the New Jersey um, uh, 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 Attorney General's Office. Um, I, I often like to refer to uh, Judge Cuff and our very own Judge Cleary as my very own personal Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, uh, Judge uh, Justice Long as well. Um, in, particularly, in particular, um, Justice Long and J J Judge Cuff have been responsible for turning the light bulb um, on in my head, and I always tell Judge Cuff about this, with at least two of their land use decisions, and particularly for someone who is going to embark on a career, a judicial career, or a professional legal career in land use. Um, I refer to uh, Justice Long's decision in Jock versus Board of Adjustment of Wall Township and Judge Cuff's decision in Ten Terry Dom Partnership as land use for dummies. Uh, once I read those cases, the light bulb on a C variance um, completely came on. Um, last but certainly not least, um, Professor Penny Avenides, who is the Dickinson Debevoise Scholar at Rutgers University School of Law and the Director of, hum of the Human Rights Clinic at the law school. Um, she specializes in civil, uh, civil rights and international human rights law. And in 2016, she was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from the New Jersey Law Journal. Um, today, these three fantastic women um, are going to give us a discussion about um, the life and work of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And many of you who have followed the work of um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg know that over the last three or four years, um, she became a cultural pop icon. And many folks asked the question, how is it that an 85-year-old Jewish grandmother becomes a cultural pop icon um, over 20 years after she was appointed to our nation's highest court? And um, when you look at many of uh, her personal story and her attributes, um, they kind of play into what is really relevant and important and what folks really crave at this time um, in our country and our society. Um, she was a badass um, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, her image was emblazoned on t-shirts and artwork. Um, she was the subject of memes um, and even a workout book from her personal trainer. Um, she was the star in movies and documentaries um, and a riff on hip hop culture uh, coined her the notorious RBG. Um, she was courageous by any standards and I look so forward uh, to hearing from some of the comments from our panelists. And so if you go back and ask yourself the question, um, 
how did she become this cultural pipe, uh, pop icon? Um, in the words of um, her Brooklynite, Christopher Wallace, who was the notorious B.I.G., um, if you don't know, now you know. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the professor uh, to begin the program, and I am so excited um, to sit back and hear it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much um, for starting the program, Judge Thornton. That was really great. Um, I'm delighted um, to be here to be um, celebrating um, Women's History Month and uh, the Notorious RBG with um, two other pathbreakers, um, uh, Judge Mary Catherine Cuff and Justice Virginia Long, um, who in their own right have really, really blazed trails here in New Jersey and um, certainly have made it easier for uh, women of my generation and uh, women um, and my students um, at Rutgers Law School to um, pursue our dreams. And I wanna give a shout out to Rebecca Heilman who um, helped organize this program and selected the panel and, um, and um, thank her for all her work. Um, anyway, so uh, the format here is I will be asking questions of Judge Cuff and Justice Long, and we will have questions at the end by the audience. I hope you enjoy our program. And um, as Judge Thornton said, um, I think that um, sort of uh, your best experience will be if you just put it on speaker view um, so that you can get a full screen of, of everyone who's um, speaking. Um, as, as Judge uh, Thornton said, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg became a huge pop icon. And, um, and uh, many of you may know some facts about her life, but for those who don't, um, I think it's important to frame this discussion in terms of her uh, life experiences. And uh, there's a famous story when uh, Justice Ginsburg was a student, one of five women at Harvard Law School, the dean invited uh, all the women to a nice tea party and she was very excited to go. Um, and um, the purpose of this tea party was not to congratulate um, these women who were brilliant and uh, you know, one of a handful of women who were, um, who were permitted to enter the doors of Harvard Law School in the early 1950s. Um, they thought that it was a celebration, but in reality, he uh, chided them for um, taking space in the class um, and um, a space that would go to a man and a breadwinner for his family. And um, she said that that was really a, um, you know, an event that, that shaped her, that shaped her life. Um, and another event that shaped her life was um, that she couldn't get a job after law school because she was a woman. And um, it's hard for us to imagine that that's the case, but it really was, and it was overt discrimination. Um, and, um, you know, we know that our pathbreakers, Judge Cuff and Justice Long, um, experienced, um, you know, similar, um, you know, similar discrimination, um, and uh, that's what makes their achievement all the more um, impressive. So, um, you know, sort of using that as a background, Justice Long, you were at Rutgers Law School from uh, 1963 to 1966. Um, and you, um, and that's your time there uh, coincided with Justice Ginsburg, who was then Professor Ginsburg, um, who taught at Rutgers Law School. Um, and can you just tell us a few things? Can you tell us what the atmosphere was like in the, you know, early to mid 1960s um, at Rutgers Law School? And uh, what your experience was like as a woman trying to find a job in the, uh, mid 1960s after you graduated from law school. And also if you could sprinkle in a few anecdotes about Justice Ginsburg, I'm sure our audience would love to hear, hear them. Um, Justice Ginsburg was a woman of her time. I know that because her time was my time. Um, when you say to me, you went to law school in the 60s, I'm sure that there are people in the audience who are thinking about psychedelic vans and LSD and, and love beads, but it wasn't like that at all. Um, it was really just the leftover 1950s at that point. And the, the, the male law students wore suits and ties 
and the women wore dresses and heels, which I don't think that you would find um, today. And the law school was reflective of the world outside. Um, keep in mind that at that time, there were men only flights on United Airlines, that three fourths of the federal civil service positions were men only. Um, a medical school dean who um, was asked the question, do you take women? He said, yes, we take one, and then we take another one to keep her company. Um, this was baked into the culture, and this was the culture that she experienced, as did the women of my class. Now, law school was not much different. We had one female teacher, that was Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and everybody knows her for all the women's rights classes that she taught, but that's not what she taught. She taught civil procedure. And I think that that's a reflective of, of what life was like at that time. She was wonderful, incidentally, but the subject, international shoe, is not the most interesting case that you can be teaching. Now, law school, basically set us up for the world outside. It was a microcosm. People there asked us, just as Justice Ginsburg was asked, what are you doing here? You're taking the, the position of a person who is going to be a breadwinner, and you are never going to practice law. That was really the belief. Um, a Wall Street Journal article in 1963 did a survey. They said women were the least wanted in firms of any size or any, um, any specialty, regardless of their class performance. The belief was that women couldn't handle themselves in the rough and tumble of the courtroom, and even worse, that juries would not like them. Um, when it was time to go out for a job, Justice Ginsburg couldn't get one anywhere. She went to 100 interviews and nobody would hire her. Eventually somebody, a friend of a friend, got her um, in touch with a position. Judges said to us, I cannot hire you because my wife would not like it if I worked closely um, with a woman. And if you got a job in and out of the courtroom, people called you honey, dearie, the adorable deputy attorney general. Judge Pressler joined the Bergen County Bar Association and was not allowed to go to the Christmas dinner. The Essex County Bar Show every year, <clears throat> the women had to sit in the balcony. Now I know this sounds <clears throat> like I'm talking about the Civil War. I'm not, I'm talking about the early 1960s. They're anecdotes, but they show where Justice Ginsburg was coming from she understood, as we understood at the time, that there would never be more than one female partner in a law firm. There would never be more than one female judge, if any, in a vicinage. So much so that women actually moved if somebody had the good luck to be appointed. Um, I would like to say that we confronted this directly, but we didn't because women of that era did not do it that, that way. We just worked harder than everybody else, knowing that we were going to cast a long shadow on those who came after us, and it worked. We became the first partners, the first judges, the first cabinet officers. But the truth is that we were women of our times, and she was a woman of her time as well. And I might add great women. <laughs> <laughs> um, and continue to be great women. Um, Judge Cuff, you also went to Rutgers Law School, yeah, Rutgers, um, and um, uh, roughly 10 years after, um, after Justice Long, by that time Rutgers accepted 45% of, um, of the class was women, which was actually very unusual for the time. Um, and can you just tell us what it was like, what that, you know, sort of how Rutgers had changed in, in those 10 years and it still was an uphill battle and you really were there during the psychedelic 60s, what people think of as that time. Can you just tell us about your experiences there as well and, and any anecdotes about Justice Ginsburg that you, um, that you can um, tell us? 
Well, I arrived in 1970 and, and think about what was going on at the time. We, we had just, no, no, 1968 was that horrible year of 1968 uh, with the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, the uproar at the Democratic National Convention. It was, it, the 60s was just a time of, of civil rights uh, demonstrations, we, but we had the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. Um, so when I arrived there, it was in, in this affirmant almost of, of activism, civil rights, uh, but also anti-war because it was also at the height of the Vietnam War. So this was, by, by any uh, measure, was an activist atmosphere. Uh, it was referred to as the People's Electric Law School. It was definitely, um, that, that was a very apt description. Um, but in the meantime, Justice Ginsburg was still there. She was there till 1972 before she left to go to Columbia. But in the meantime, between the time that Justice Long left and when I was there, uh, Arthur Kanoy uh, uh, came to uh, there uh, to teach at, um, at Rutgers. Uh, Frank Askin uh, was there. Uh, Anna Mae Shepard uh, had joined. She was doing, I think, some of the clinical work that was there. Uh, and, and it was just, it was the most invigorating atmosphere you could possibly want. Uh, some of the faculty were working on the appellate brief for the Chicago 7. The Chicago 7 want, were, were recognizable in the halls of the law school, as were their various, their various uh, 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 attorneys, because the, a lot of the, most of the appellate work was ba based at Rutgers. Rutgers Law School. It, it was it was an amazing time. Now, was it any easier for the women? Well, there was such enough of a mass that uh, you that you you could make your presence felt. Nevertheless, um, it was during that time. I think it was in 1972 that a group of the women uh, approached uh, Justice Ginsburg about uh, doing a women in the law of course, um, because she was still teaching the bread and butter courses of civil procedure. She undertook that um, and then uh, also, and discovered that there was enormous inequities, enormous inequities that still uh, were riddled our law. And that is what you begin to see in some of the litigation that in which she became involved, either as a, coming in as an amicus or whether uh, actually as an attorney of record in the case, uh, starting to chip away at these various um, inequities. Um, and I know we'll get into that a little bit more uh, later. Um, and, and she also uh, agreed to be the uh, faculty representative for the Women's Rights Law Reporter, which at the time was the first one in the country. So just in a period of really of, of, of six, seven years between the time Justice Long left and when I left, it was wildly different. And there were expectations that, that, the, that the women graduating, they were going to enter the profession many going into legal services uh, organizations, many going into public service. Thank you, Judge, um, Judge Cuff. I'm gonna switch back to, um, to Justice Long. And, um, you know, Judge Cuff just, um, you know, sort of talked to us about, um, you know, sort of Justice Ginsburg trying to teach his course about, uh, or Professor Ginsburg on women in the law and uncovering all sorts of equities. Um, you told us Justice Long about comments that judges would make towards women, wouldn't give women jobs, um, you know, that um, at most there would be one partner um, at a law firm. I started practicing law in, in, um, at a law firm in 1990, there was one woman partner in an in a international firm. There was one woman partner at the time. Um, and, um, and that was decades after you entered the job market and Justice Ginsburg 
Ginsburg tried to enter the job market. So in this milieu, right, of blatant overt sex discrimination, how is it that Judge that, um, Professor and uh, you know Ginsburg um, was able to convince these you know sexist judges who um, you know would not give jobs to women? How was she was she able to convince them that women deserved um, equal rights? Because at, when she first started litigating her cases that Judge Cuff mentioned. Um, there was no, um, you know, they had the equal protection clause had not been extended um, to protect women. Can you tell us about that? Well, I think the answer is strategy, strategy, strategy. She knew that she could not come on like a house of fire claiming women get the same rights as men, period, that that was not going to fly given the, the state of the judiciary. And so one of her, her watchwords was pick your battles. She first never used the word sex in any of her filings. She only used the word gender because it was a less loaded word and less difficult for the people who were, um, who were going to be adjudicating the case. But she also did something else that was tremendously clever, and that is she picked her plaintiffs. In Weinberger, she picked a widower, not a widow, a widower, who was denied survivor benefits that a widow got. In Frontiero, um, she took on a rule that made it harder, admittedly, for female service members um, to claim increased housing allowances, but it would be for their husbands their husband was the really aggrieved party. In Reed versus Reed, a couple's son had died, bad enough. And then they were faced with a law that said, men get preference over women as executors of the estate. Um, in Moritz, a man was denied a caregiver deduction. Um, then she took on as well, uh, the minimum drinking age, which was different in one state, it was Craig versus Boren um, for men and women. And then in Duran versus Mississippi, um, voluntary uh, jury service for women uh, was very, very important issue because she believed that was part of the duty of citizenship. The point is that she used a scalpel and not an ax. And during the time that she was using this scalpel, using the right words, using the right plaintiffs, she was moving the needle from rational basis to intermediate scrutiny to a heightened standard. And she did it by chipping away case after case. She knew she couldn't get it in one fell swoop, so she got it bit by bit. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful survey. Um, and um, so um, strategy is really, really critical. We all learned that in um, law school. And, um, you know, Justice Ginsburg exemplified, um, you know, how, how um, strategy can really, really create an entire new jurisprudence. Um, and that's the jurisprudence of women's rights, the jurisprudence that didn't exist when the Rutgers Law School students approached her and asked her to teach a course on it. So she essentially um, created it. So, um, so Judge Cuff, I'm going to come to you and say, do we, in 2021, do we have equal rights, right? You know, Justice Ginsburg chipped away, the rights expanded, the rights expanded. I'm sitting here, you're sitting here, we have lots of women in the audience. Do we have, in your view, equal rights in 2021? On paper, we do. Uh, but you still have uh, uh, of situations uh, where um, I think women have to still work harder, faster, and longer uh, to be appreciated uh, once they do uh, get a position. And I think that there are still many, many of the um, uh, of the biases uh, that, uh, uh, that have uh, always been in place 
uh, but they still seem, they still work. Um, such as why are we spending all of this money uh, to train a, uh, this young attorney who's only going to leave after four or five years when she has her first or her second child? Um, now, they don't say that out loud now. <laughs> they used to say that out loud. They, but I think it still works uh, very, uh, very much. Interestingly enough, if you look at any firm of any size, if they went back and they looked at their retention rate of any of the associates that walked in at, on year one and were go out to year five, they will find there are precious few of the initial cohort uh, because there is so much uh, transition uh, in, in the field, but it still works against women. Um, we, 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 probably the capstone uh, of, of the equal rights, particularly in education for women, is United States versus Virginia or the Virginia Military Institute case, which was, uh, that was written uh, by uh, Judge Ginsburg. And that was a, a state school. It uh, was a, the sole single sex school operated at that time in Virginia. There had been others, but they had gone co-ed. It was, it, it was essentially a military academy, it still is. Um, women were not admitted. The district court uh, um, and the fourth circuit, shall we say, viewed uh, the st a state remedy had been put up that, that a women's college was going to offer a, a women's leadership training program and that should that should should work. Now think about that. We're at separate but equal, right? That goes it on appeal. Justice Ginsburg said no. Wrote the majority opinion, and it's exquisite language. And that to defend a gender-based discrimination claim, that the institution must demonstrate an exceedingly persuasive justification for that action. And went on to say that genuine, not hypothesized or invented justifications post hoc filing of the complaint would do. And that was an enormous victory. So what happened is that we now have women being freely admitted to VMI, to our military academies. But what we're dealing with now, we hear repeatedly out reports of sexual harassment. So the question, the answer is, we have the rights, but we, there are still tremendous barriers to women advancing. Thank you for your very thoughtful answer. And I want to just take that a, a step further um, and really, you know, celebrate our judiciary here in New Jersey. Um, the New Jersey judiciary is known as um, among the best um, state judiciaries in the country, um, particularly in its recognition of women's rights and civil rights. And, you know, there have been instances, um, I practiced constitutional law where, um, it does not make sense to file a claim in federal court because the um, federal courts, um, you know, still um, have not fully recognized uh, women's equality, even despite the VMI um, decision that you spoke of, just Judge Cup. So, um, can can I'm going to call on Justice Long first, and then come back to you, Judge Cup. Can you each talk about? Um, ways in which the New Jersey um, judiciary has been ahead of its time in not only recognizing women's rights, um, but also civil rights in general, and also talk about the New Jersey law against discrimination, which also um, really is ahead of its time and um, you know, continues to be a path breaker. Um, and um, anyway, so why don't you start us off, um, Justice Long? Sure. Our, our constitution offers very broad equal protection rights. And our New Jersey LAD is basically a pioneer um, a statute. However, 
if the courts had not broadly protected the rights of our fellow citizens, these things could have laid fallow as occasionally they do in the federal system as a result of federal interpretations. If you go back and look at Jar Justice Garibaldi's opinion in Lehman versus Toys R Us, um, which was the hostile work environment and sex harassment um, uh, was identified, she came right out and said, we do not hesitate to depart from federal precedent to decide what is best for our citizens, to protect our fellow citizens. Uh, broad interpretations of LAD, it is 2021, but in 2021, Justice Lavecchia's opinion in Delanoy versus the Township of Ocean, in 2021, there were two different light duty schedules in a police department, one for pregnant people and one for every, everybody else. And again, um, the court uh, struck that down. Judge Cuff in uh, Smith versus Millville um, included marital, st said that marital status includes not just married people, but separated people, people in the process of divorce, people who are divorced. So giving a broader, a broader reading to that. Um, judicial conduct, you may recently have seen a judge lost his job, among other things, for his treatment of a domestic violence victim. I think the most important message that you can take from all of this is that our courts have never tethered themselves to federal interpretations, either of the Equal Protection Clause or of cognate um, statutes. Uh, and I'd like to just hearken back to some language of Justice Clifford in State versus Hempley, which is actually a Fourth Amendment case but it resonates here. And th these aren't his exact words. I'm just paraphrasing because I don't have them in front of me. Here's what he said. Hey, we look for wisdom from the United States Supreme Court when it interprets the Equal Protection Clause or any constitutional provision. But although it is the star that guides us as we navigate our way through our own constitution, we can't be fixed on that star. We bear the ultimate responsibility for the safe passage of our ship. We have to look ahead as well as above. Our job is to protect our fellow citizens. And that's what you get from the New Jersey Supreme Court jurisprudence. Thank you, Justice Long. Judge Cuff, you, um, you served um, uh, in the appellate division. You served also on the New Jersey Supreme Court um, as well, why don't you give us your thoughts um, on how the New Jersey judiciary really, really is ahead of its time um, and continues to be ahead of its time in terms of recognizing um, win women's rights and, and civil rights more broadly? Well, I think that what we should recognize, too, is that our law against discrimination is, has never been static. And to that, we have to also thank the legislature. Uh, the legislature, that ha is a document that has, a statute has been amended repeatedly over the years. And in many instances codifies uh, decisions uh, that have uh, been uh, from uh, that, either from the Supreme Court or the appellate division. And it, uh, so it's, it is a, um, it's it's a living document, and and I think that you'll you'll see with the appellate division as well as the Supreme Court, they view it as such. They view it as a living document, um, so that as a result, you you we we had um, in two thousand six the the on sexual orientation. We had Lewis versus Harris, which then led which that decision uh, was an, uh, that. This issue was whether the state's marriage laws permissibly distinguish between same sex and heterosexual couples. The result of that was the court said no. <laughs> and and but the result was the legislature adopted the civil union statute. Not long after, in 2013, we had Garden State Equality. And that is what led uh, that, that was the follow up to Lewis. 
And that led to same-sex marriage being recognized in New Jersey. So it's it's it becomes a a it's it it's a it's a organic the equal protection clause in the Constitution and the LAD have become organic documents, not something that just decorates a shelf. Um, the um, Justice Long um, uh, had a fabulous opinion in in uh, in VC versus MJB. Which involved uh, the, the 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 recognition of the psychological parent, and uh, which can uh, happen in either in same sex unions where children um, uh, have been born uh, or have been adopted, um, but it also, of course, uh, applies in in heterosexual couples where a step parent can certainly become a psychological parent. And but it's a it's it's a recognition of of people's um, uh, that that you can't just put people in boxes and they're hermetically sealed because you're living these are people and they're not only people but we also have uh, a living breathing concept of equal treatment to all. And one thing I did want to mention when we were talking about the pregnancy discrimination uh, recent decision just earlier this month is written by Justice Lovecchia, who's also a Rutgers grad. That's great. Uh, uh, so thank you so much to both of you for being such, you know, part of this amazing institution, the New Jersey Judiciary. And thank you to all the other judges who are here as well. Um, I know that um, law students from around the country really clamor to get clerkships with the New Jersey um, judiciary for the reasons that you've both spoken about and, um, and um, you know, because of the important decisions that you both uh, told us about. Um, so uh, I'm gonna switch back to Justice Ginsburg for a second and ask, um, uh, Justice Long, Justice Ginsburg famously said that the most important decision that a woman can make um, is who she chooses to be her life partner. Um, so I'll have both of you comment on it. Justice Long, do you wanna give a few comments and then we'll switch over to Judge Kelly? Sure, it means that um, if you have a partner who shares the load, which I did, um, that makes the load lighter. It doesn't take the load away completely, however. Uh, Judge Cuff, I, I guess we, you know, sort of uh, see a lot of this uh, during the pandemic where the burden has really fallen on women to, um, you know, to be uh, professionals and teachers to their children mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, house cleaners and, and all of that. Um, we'd love to hear your comments on it. Well, I couldn't agree more with Justice Ginsburg's um, position. Uh, your, the selection of your life partner is critical. Uh, I was very fortunate. My husband was a full participant in uh, the raising of our children um, and, and various tasks around the house. Um, we were fortunate. We were so fortunate that we also were able to have quality health, uh, quality child care. And oh, so so many so many things we were so fortunate um, that uh, I have no doubt that if if this were if we had school aged children now and we were homeschooling that it would have been a team effort. I have no doubt about that. You're both extraordinary lucky in that respect because I don't know that um, all the women on this uh, call can can say the same, but it really is critical to find someone who respects you and respects you professionally as well as personally um, to be your life partner. I think that's a lesson that we can all carry with us. Um, so this is the last question before we begin taking, um, taking uh, questions from the audience. I'll start with you, Judge Cuff, and give Justice Long the last word. If you could change one thing in our society um, or culture today that you believe would lead to gender equality, what would it be? I think adoption of the ERA uh, would, would certainly help though. 
uh, we were just talking beforehand that there's so much misinformation floating about uh, uh, regarding that. We can eliminate the misinformation. One woman said to me several years ago, but I don't want to be forced to go to work. I said, that's not what the ERA will do. <laughs> Uh, but I think the adoption of the ERA would be certainly would be a, a recognition um, that we are all entitled to equal treatment, including equal pay. That's for sure. Um, and actually, you know, I'm not supposed to say this, but you know, about our beloved Rutgers, but Justice Ginsburg actually brought a class action suit on behalf of women faculty members uh, under the Equal Pay Act because despite the fact that Justice Ginsburg was teaching a full load and then a, on top of it all, running the, um, the women's rights a law reporter and also teaching the seminar that she had to make up from scratch, she was not paid as well as her male counterparts. Um, so Justice Long, we'll give you the last word before we start uh, uh, taking questions from the audience. And if you could change one thing, right? I can think of 10 things, but if you can <laughs> yeah. down to one, what would it be to, for us to achieve um, full gender equality? This is the, a segue off the last answer about choosing your partner. Every iota of social research tells us that today, even in the most egalitarian homes, women are working, still working a, an additional shift and that they are doing 100% um, more um, of the detritus of child rearing um, than their husbands are doing. And they cannot keep all of those balls juggled. And it's just simply a fact. And as a result, many of them are giving up their professions. So in my view, what has to happen is that society needs to recognize this reality. Um, and when I say society, I mean, not by firm policies allowing flexible schedules where it's the road to the door mm -hmm. or a mentor whispering in your ear, uh, don't do it. It's a career su It's career suicide. I mean, real policies that will take into account the fact that women are doing double duty in, in their everyday lives. Um, that's a change in the culture that is really difficult, but um, every woman cannot be uber woman, nor should she have to be. Um, so the workplace needs to change. Well, hopefully our very responsive uh, New Jersey legislature will, um, you know, will, um, you know, be able to, um, and sort of help in that regard. And collectively, we can all try to make that happen. And maybe the New Jersey judiciary will actually um, give us some law to, um, to really encourage um, uh, what you've discussed um, to happen. Um, so I really feel, you know, totally, you know, completely privileged to have been able to moderate this wonderful um, discussion. And I'm going to share, share the wealth with members of the audience and um, allow them to also ask you um, some questions. So I'm gonna open it up and Rebecca Heilman will read um, questions from the audience for both of you. Thank you. We do have one question here for the speakers and it asks from your vantage points, what is the most significant current gap in equal protection relating to gender today? And what do you identify as the next battleground for equality under the law? Well, uh, the last question first, the bat, we're in the next battleground, which is um, transgender rights and uh, the rights that come out of the issues that are, are uh, being raised by the LGBT community. We are already in that fight. Um, equal pay for equal work remains an issue. I mean, again, the social science research still tells us, maybe not in the highest echelons, but the average woman makes 80 cents on the dollar. Um, and something has to be done about that. That means you are working for free from January to like March. Yep. Uh, something needs to be done as far as that is concerned. And of course, as 
Judge Cuff mentioned before, some accommodation for the real lives that women live. Okay, we do have another question here. And it asks, what- Why don't we have Judge, if Judge- Oh, I'm sorry. To add something to that, that would be great. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, I think we're, we're taught the, um, the sec, the, all of the various claims related to sexual orientation um, are, are certainly front and center at this point in time. But, and I also agree, equal pay. Uh, I read the, uh, not, not very long ago, the New Jersey equal pay uh, statute. Um, and it's it's one of those statutes that has you know just wonderful uh, wonderful statements of policy, and then you get into the weeds and you say, my goodness, I could I could drive a Mack truck through this, uh, and it, and so we it needs still needs work. I read something yes just yesterday that was called Equal Pay Day, which meant that the, a man and a woman having the same job that the woman would have had to work until yesterday to earn the same amount of money the man in the same job earned in all of 2020. That is just completely unacceptable. Rebecca, is there another question? Yes. We have a question from someone who would like to know what men can do to become allies to women with respect to workplace rights and equality in general? How can men become better allies? Well, the vast majority of um, managing partners in law firms are men. And what they can do just in their own little bailiwick is see to it that there is um, a recognition um, of the actual lives of the women who are working in these firms and that the policies or the so-called policies that they institute, in fact, keep the women in the workplace and do not just send them out on the road. I agree. And also that, that, that men in the workplace, be a mentor. Ask to have a, a, uh, a, a, young, a young woman partner or a, or, or a young woman associate to, to be on, on their cases, to work their cases. Give them opportunity, give them visibility. Um, and and uh, that can go a very, very long way. And just one more thing. If you're a rainmaker in a firm and you get to pick whoever you want to work with you, make sure you pick some of the women who are working on these part-time schedules. What happens is that the rainmaker says, no, I have to have somebody who is right at my elbow five days a week. That forecloses any woman who has any alternative schedule from getting the best cases. Exactly. It's true. Although I think they say someone at my elbow seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Oh, right. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having worked in a law firm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, anything else, Judge Cuff, you want to add anything to that? I don't think so. Okay, next question. Okay, I'm going to combine these. They're a bit similar. Um, the first is, what is the greatest challenge that women face today in the legal field? And the second is, what advice would you give to female law students, both as individuals and professionals, trying to challenge gender discrimination? So what are the challenges facing women in the legal profession today? And what advice do you have for female law students, individually and professionally, as they try to advocate against gender discrimination? Well, I, I, I've already said what I think the biggest challenge is, and that is, um, accommodating the real lives of women um, in the various aspects of the profession, whether it's a private law firm, government, there has to be some accommodation for the real lives that women live. And that is a challenge and it continues to be a challenge. I mean, honestly, uh, this is 120 years after every state of the union allowed women to become lawyers. Women were so optimistic at the time 
that they would be completely integrated into the profession and that there would be no distinctions, no difficulties, but we're still grappling with many of the equity, same equity issues today. Um, it's, it's a difficult problem, but I think we need to look at Justice Ginsburg, uh, who spent her entire life trying to create an ethical, fair, and just workplace. And I think we need to pick up those cudgels ourselves. How do we do it? Everybody's gonna do it in a different way. You might become management in your firm. You might become a legislator. You might become a judge, what have you. But um, there is one rule, however, it was Justice Ginsburg's rule and it is the rule of everybody I know who's ever been successful in the law. And that is do the work. If you do the work, no one can hurt you and if you don't do the work, no one can help you. I would encourage law students and women also uh, to seriously consider entering public service. Uh, I, I went from a clerkship uh, directly to the division of law. I can never complain that I did not get responsibility, sometimes more responsibility than I thought was justified at the time, <laughs> but I learned so much. You, when you are, you, you, you had to figure, you had to figure it out as, as Justice Long just said, you have to do the work. And, and aside from the fact that you're dealing with issues that are of, of current currency in your state and perhaps also in the, uh, the country. I can remember reading the, the Star Ledger at breakfast and, say, and saying, oh, I think we're gonna be getting an application for a preliminary injunction on this new rule. <laughs> And sure enough, usually within two or three days, somebody, I was sending somebody across the street to handle it, uh, or I would be handling it myself. Uh, it, public service, I think, and particularly in New Jersey, has been a pathway for so many of the women who, and particularly the women who came on the bench early, Virginia uh, came on, and, and we had Marilyn. Uh, it came on very early. Um, it just, uh, it, it was a, it was a true pathway. Um, we were given, we were given opportunity. We were given responsibility. We were given visibility. And I think that that still holds true uh, in, in certainly in the U S attorney's office and also in the uh, attorney general's office in New Jersey. So uh, that would be something that I would encourage uh, women to do. That's great advice. Um, very, very um, good advice. Uh, Rebecca, um, I'll let you determine how many, how much uh, more time we have for questions, but I think we, um, we're ready for one more. Okay, I think we will make this the final question then. Um, and it is a, a variation on an earlier question, but as New Jersey is a progressive state in addressing women's concerns, this individual is wondering what you think um, of the future of female rights on the federal and state level. And this says specifically female rights. And it asks you, do you believe the rights of females will approximate those of males? So I think this is a future oriented question, but do you believe that the rights of females will approximate those of males? I do, but the question is how long it will take for there to be absolute equity. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, as I said before, on paper, we have, we have uh, equal rights. Uh, actually, uh, seeing the fruits of that, um, I think will still take time. Um, and I, I wanted to say, to add something to that, is that uh, the Rutgers Law School faculty voted just a few weeks ago to um, resurrect our women's rights clinic, which has been dormant for a while and we are going to name it the Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg ah. Justice Clinic. So I'm hoping 
Um, and I know that that clinic actually will work very, very hard um, for us to achieve uh, gender equality in New Jersey, around the country and around the world. Um, we will work very, very hard for that. Um, I really wanna thank so much um, Judge Cuff and Justice Long for sharing um, their thoughts with us, their experience, um, uh, telling us what their thoughts are about the future. I also wanna um, thank Judge Thornton um, for, um, for really, uh, uh, and Rebecca Heilman for organizing this program. And um, I don't know if Judge Thornton wants to come back on and you know say goodbye to everybody, but I really have thoroughly enjoyed this, this discussion and I have, I've learned a tremendous amount. Thank you. Professor, I was, and, and I'm sure I speak for everybody else. I think Capri tells me there were over 100 folks in attendance today. I was sitting on the edge of my seat. It was a good idea that I was able to turn my camera off because my nose was right on the screen. <laughs> um, but man, did I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy that. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just meeting you today, Professor. Um, I have been lucky enough to have met Justice Long and I consider uh, Judge Cuff a dear friend. And every time I am in her presence, I am, you know, her and my dear friend, Judge Cleary, I'm always on the edge of my seat listening to their fantastic stories. Um, you know, it was fantastic. I agree. I thank Rebecca. Um, I hope everyone is safe and blessed. Um, but your presence today really has been a blessing to the Mammoth Bismuth today. Thank you, Penny. Okay, well, thank you every, everyone for joining us. Thanks uh, to our uh, program organizers. And, you know, again, a big round of applause for Judge Cuff and, and, and Justice Long. You're really remarkable. And thank you for being a role model to me and a role model, I think, uh, for many other women who are on this, uh, participating in this program. Thank you.